Well, good afternoon. I call this public hearing of the America 250 PA Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee to order. And the purpose of today's hearing is to identify infrastructure and projects that not only highlight each region's history and contributions to our shared Pennsylvania history, um, up to and including the semi-quincentennial in 2026. Um, it's taken me a while to get that to where I don't trip over that word, right? So this committee has been tasked with identifying potential infrastructure, investments, and projects to showcase Pennsylvania's vital role in the establishment and growth of the United States in the 250 years since our nation's founding in 1776. The committee was established as the legislative advisory group to support the work on the larger America 250 PA organization. We are a bipartisan, bicameral effort, and our work has been subdivided into six regions of Pennsylvania, each of which is represented by two members, one of each party of the Pennsylvania House and the Senate of Pennsylvania, as well as members from the overall leadership team and ex officio members. So before I begin, I would love to thank the fine people here in College Township for hosting our, our meeting here today in their chamber. And I would like to welcome my co-chair and good friend, uh, the gentleman from Philadelphia, Representative Solomon, for a few opening remarks. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Thank you so much, Senator. Um, so let me just uh, give you a sense of where we, where we are in the process, what we hope to accomplish, and then the next steps. So where we are in the process, right? We got the legislation uh, through Governor Wolf signed, this particular legislation which allow us to do these hearings. The purpose is to explore ways to welcome the rest of the country and hopefully an international community right here to Pennsylvania, all 67 counties. Idea being, how do we prepare with infrastructure investments to best highlight our past, present, and then look towards the future, beyond, far beyond. 2026. So, well, our first hearing was in your county, um, Senator's home, and we heard testimony what the folks in that region uh, thought would be best in order to do that work, in order to welcome the rest of the country and the world to Pennsylvania in that region, in York County and beyond. Now we're here. And so after this, we're going to continue moving along throughout the Commonwealth. And once we're done, we do it again. Another, another round uh, throughout Pennsylvania, identifying more projects. At the end of this process, we as a bipartisan, bicameral commission will get together and figure out which investments we want to recommend to the House and Senate. The idea being that if all 67 counties commit to this, every state rep and every state senator has skin in the game, we cannot fail. Because if, they then want, if, if we do fail, then a particular rep or senator doesn't get their particular project. So that's the goal here, to get buy-in from all 67 counties. And I want to thank you all for being part of that process. The work continues when we're done because we want you to be active in talking to your representative and senator about the importance of your particular project. I want to introduce our next, our executive director. Oh, uh, Representative Mursky is stuck in traffic. He will be here soon. No, yeah. <laughs> never. It, it's, it's probably somewhere else other than Happy Valley. It's like being from Philadelphia when I got to Harrisburg and people said, oh, beware of the Harrisburg traffic. <laughs> and the Harrisburg traffic lasts all of three to five minutes in the morning. Um, so he will be here shortly and we appreciate him uh, making the trip out here. 
uh, Cassandra Coleman's our amazing executive director, America 250 PA, and she will give some opening remarks. Thank you to both of you, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Excuse my voice. I woke up yesterday with no voice. I'm slowly coming back. But, you know, we are the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's commission that was charged with planning and coordinating all of the programming projects and events around the 250th anniversary in 2026. And it's such a historic milestone opportunity. Um, Pennsylvania is leading the country on the 250th activities right now. We want to continue to do that. And the way we continue to do that is with partners like all of you in this room. Um, continuing to partner, continuing to make sure that we are putting our best step, or excuse me, our best foot forward and showing the rest of the country um, and continuing to lead like we did 250 years ago. Um, so we're here today, as the representative and the senator mentioned, to listen to what you think um, are legacy projects that should be part of the 250th anniversary. Um, and we're just really excited to, to hear the testimony today. I encourage you to go to our website at America250PA.org to learn about all of the programs and projects we currently have um, going on. I'm sure there's plenty um, within the region that you might want to get involved in. So in addition to that, I, should we go into the hearing process or do you want to do intros first? Sure, I'm going to pass it over to Representative Takik. Thank you very much. Want to welcome everybody to not only the 82nd district, uh, but also to College Township. Uh, this is literally home turf for me. I was a member of College Township Council and served for years in this room, uh, literally in this chair, uh, one of the years. So uh, this is great. I, I, it's wonderful to look out and see so many familiar faces. And what I'm particularly excited about is the opportunity to showcase Really, one of the things that makes our community so special, it's all of the resources and all of the people who've put the work into building infrastructure around uh, the history, the culture, the civics, the educational opportunities here, not only in Center County, but across Central Pennsylvania. So I really appreciate everyone being here today. I look forward to um, the opportunity for you to, to tell your story. And I also want to recognize, if I can, a couple of folks who uh, have representatives here who will not be speaking. First, uh, there is a brand new representative in the uh, central part of Pennsylvania from Senator John Fetterman's office in attendance. His name is Elliot Copeland, if you would say hello to him. I believe he's literally in his first week on the job, and he's also a very recent Penn State grad, so we are. Uh, welcome to Happy Valley. Uh, I also want to recognize um, Representative Scott Conklin's office is here. Tor Michaels is representing him, so thank you for being here, sir. And I'll let um, David introduce himself. But again, welcome to College Township. Welcome to the 82nd District. My house is literally less than a mile over the hill. Um, not doing any kind of hosting afterwards, but I'm happy to point out some great brew pubs or you know great restaurants here in town. So welcome to Happy Valley, and uh, look forward to hearing everyone. So thank you. Hello, my name is David Smith. I'm the new kid on the block. I'm here representing Representative Benninghoff, and I wasn't expecting to be up front, so I wanted to be back there, but, <laughs> you know, um, I'm here, and I want to be over here on the, the side where they're sitting. But anyway, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. And if I might just add to, Representative Benninghoff is also a member of the Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee uh, for our America 250 PA as well. So we're going to go into just explaining quickly um, what the process today is going to be. So um, one of the chairs will introduce the representative and the organization that will be testifying. You will have five minutes to testify. Um, when you have 30 seconds left, you're going to hear one ding, Katie. And then <laughs> when you hit your five minutes, you will hear two dings. 
Um, just so that that doesn't alarm anybody. Um, so we were just asked that once you hear the one, you finish, <laughs> finish up your sentence or your thought. Um, and then after that, you'll have three minutes, um, up to three minutes, if the committee has any questions for you and your project. So I think with that, we could get started with testimony. Thank you. Uh, we want to call up the Phillipsburg Revitalization Corporation, Eric Rusnak. Eric, did I get your name right? Yes, you did. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Eric, come on up. Welcome and thanks so much. Thank you. I have some material, additional material to pass out to the panel. Okay, that will that will be included in the five minutes. I'm just I'm, I'm just kidding. kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Wait, get the bell ready. Get the bell ready. <laughs> Ready for me? Is, is the mic in a good spot? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eric Rusnak. I'm the president of the Phillipsburg Revitalization Corporation. We are a nonprofit, all volunteer uh, organization in Phillipsburg that helps to improve the economy and quality of life uh, in our area. Uh, and I've come here today to uh, present uh, a proposal for a project that is kind of underway in, in our area in Center and Clearfield County. And I, and I want you to keep this quote in mind. I keep telling people this. A town will not thrive with polluted water running through it. And that's what we have in Phillipsburg. Coal mining in the Meshannon Valley has been the backbone of American progress for more than 100 years. Our coal fueled the Industrial Revolution, was critical in achieving victory in two world wars, and provided our electricity to our nation for generations. Families settled in our area and built their lives around extracting coal from the ground. They mined tunnels into the mountain, they dug holes, and they opened up pits. But today, the residents of Meshannon Valley live with the effects of this American success story. Old deep mines discharge polluted waters into our creeks and rivers. Piles of coal refuse scar our landscape. Abandoned mining pits create environmental hazards that negatively impact our quality of life. Phillipsburg and surrounding communities have been saddled with the liability of polluted water for much of the last century. The Meshannon Creek, which runs from Ginter to the west branch of the Susquehanna River, is badly polluted from years of coal and clay mining. Deposits of iron, manganese, sulfur, and other chemicals make the water red, giving rise to the nickname the Red Mo. Over the years, the government has used tax dollars to treat water. Uh, there have been water treatment systems, contractors have been hired to push old pits closed, ground has been graded, trees have been planted. Uh, all of the easy things have been done, but our land and water remain polluted. Today, it's time to finish the job. The Phillipsburg Revitalization Corporation, or PRC, is working with Phillipsburg-based Junior Coal Contracting, which is a family-owned coal company with active surface mines in Center and Clearfield counties as well as a coal preparation plant in Decatur Township called Leslie Tipple. Junior Coal Sister Company, JR Land Company, is one of the la area's largest landowners, and it holds thousands of acres of abandoned mine land along the Meshannon Creek. As Pennsylvania celebrates the 250th anniversary of the United States, the owners of Junior Coal wish to have a legacy project of their own. The proposed project is called the Empire Remining and Reclamation Project, and one of the materials that I handed up to you is a description, uh, packet of describing that. It will be the first of its kind venture between Junior Coal Contracting, JR Land Company, and nonprofits such as the PRC and local watershed groups to remine and reclaim two large tracts of land along the Shannon Creek and its tributaries. When one talks about a mine reclamation job, often they're just referring to filling in an abandoned stripping pit or regrading land or rerouting water. 
The concept of backfilling and regrading abandoned mine sites is tried and failed. It does not address the water and soil problems from deep mines below the surface of open pits. In order to properly correct the problem, the ground adjacent to the Meshannon Creek needs to be dug up and properly reclaimed, a process referred to as remining. I passed up to you uh, also a state policy statement from the Meshannon Creek Watershed Association, which is an organization that works in our area. And they have stated that the Meshannon Creek Water Association recognizes that remining is an important component of the overall strategy to return the entire Meshannon Creek watershed to a healthy condition. They say rather than treating discharges at their source, an efficient way of dealing with them is to actually at attack the, the water at its source, which is where remining comes in. Now when you have a watershed group calling for coal mining, you know you have a problem. And you, this is where attention can be drawn in a, in a way that shows a, a good partnership between the coal company and the, um, the watershed group. Uh, I've put together s some materials for you that you can see. The idea for our project is to get nonprofit organizations to apply for grant money to help fund the nonprofit, unprofitable aspects of this remining operation, particularly the addition of lime uh, and the uh, building of treatment systems for any untreated water. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Rusnak? Representative? Thank you very much for your testimony. I'm really interested in this. I'm uh, particularly interested in the, the reference to the importance of remining and critical minerals. I'm actually a member of the House Environmental Resources and Energy Committee and actually am chairing a subcommittee on mining. And as the former chair of the Spring Creek Watershed Commission, you do not have to convince me <laughs> of the importance of, of clean water. But this is absolutely an emerging question given our reliance on foreign sources of critical minerals, uh, particularly to power our electronics, consumer electronics, and, and a green energy economy, and all of the, the solar panels and batteries and other things that we need. Given our reliance, I know that there's a lot of interest uh, at the national level. There's uh, interest from like the Appalachian Regional Commission and others. Do you have any particular research or academic partners? I know that there's a lot of research in this area. Yeah, we've wor currently been working with a couple of professors at the Penn State College of Earth and Mineral Sciences to explore lithium deposits between uh, below the lowest lo layer of coal, seam of coal, which is we, we would refer to as the A seam of coal. And uh, one way in which we can, we've done some test drilling and those uh, tests are being analyzed right now. But one way in which we could partner with someone like that through this process is that the A seam of coal has been deep mined out. And so it need, now needs to be daylighted and surface mined. Once that coal is removed, the lithium is believed to be in the clay just below that coal. And so the way I sometimes describe it is the battery for your Prius is underneath our coal. <laughs> and this is a, a way that we can work to clean up the water through remining, but also get to clean energy resources because we're going to have to dig for it anyway. Right. And other critical minerals as other well, cobalt, minerals. manganese, yes. rare earth minerals, all of the rest. Th I think this is a really critical potential win-win for folks. So I, I hope to continue the conversation beyond the confines of this, and particularly to look for funding mechanisms to help further this research and possibly help out your project. I, I did want to make one thing clear I wasn't able to get to. The, the coal company proposes to use its own resources to go first. It owns the coal, it owns the land, it owns the, the equipment. It will mine its own coal. The, uh, what keeps it from mining coal and reclaiming is some of the things that uh, reduce the profitability, including the addition of limestone and um, trucking of refuse coal, things like that. So that's where you can turn something that's not profitable into something 
it is profitable. Right, with a win-win for everyone yes. with the commercial viability. Yes. So thank you very much for introducing the topic. Thank you. And I, I would invite anyone who would like to come uh, and tour some of these sites, uh, let me know. Chairman Solomon, oh. for questions. There oh. are additional questions. Oh, there are. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. I, no. I heard the bell, yeah, so I, I thought. Uh, I know. I was confused by it myself. <laughs> I, I thought I, I didn't thought know if was I was supposed to, to leave. I didn't they know were cutting going me on. off. <laughs> um, so I just to, to be, just better understand. Like I'm on page ten of your slide deck here. The Little Pit operation will connect two mining operations, Sandy Ridge, GFCC, with Lindsay and crossover SR nine. 70 along Trout Run, deep coal and clay mines will be daylighted and reclaimed, bony refuse piles cleaned up, water improved in Trout Run and Cold Stream. What, what, is, what does that mean? Can you explain that? So the, the coal company owns all of the ground between the village of Sandy Ridge and the borough of Osceola Mills, or at least the majority of it, and most of it has been mined. They're currently working on a reclamation project called the Sandy Ridge GFCC, which is government funded construction contract, even though there's no, it's kind of a misnomer, there's no government funding. It's, a, it's the, the government, uh, the state allows the coal company to do a reclamation project and remove the coal incidental to doing it. Um, that, op that project is going on right now. The uh, Lindsay operation uh, was, is, is an active permit, uh, but has recently been backfilled and so um, there is still coal to be removed, and there's deep mines under the Lindsay operation that discharge water into the Machannon Creek. And so as a point of reference, to sort of get people's mind around it, um, what we are saying is we want to connect these two mines. They're about five miles apart, and mine everything in between them. And part of the reason why I present it this way is that if you, when you go to the Department of Environmental Protection and ask for a mining permit, they're not going <coughs> to, uh, they're not going to be inclined to give you a mining permit for 1,700 acres. They might not even be inclined to give you a mining permit for 17 acres. And so, uh, part of my role as the PRC president and also an advocate for the coal company is to start thinking about these projects differently, um, and saying that if you if we could get a big project underway, if we can connect two mines that are five miles apart and have some real investment and uh, you know, we can project the work that's going to be coming, people know that they're going to have jobs, things like that, then companies can invest, the coal company can invest capital, fuel companies can invest capital, uh, that, that type of thing. And then the big pit operation, I guess if you have a little pit, you have to have a big pit, um, is the same concept. It just connects two active mining permits um, that are along an, another stretch of the creek. And additional, so, but additional permitting would be required, yeah, right? Yeah, there's no permit for, the only permits that, that, it, that exist are for these operation, um, for the like Sandy Ridge and Lindsay operation, but the ground in between is, it's abandoned mine land that's not perm permitted to, right. to um, be mined. And then for the actual work, what would be the, the number of jobs you could see created? Um, I think that it depends on how, what kind of permit uh, is achieved or obtained. Um, but, you know, I could see there being hundreds of jobs being created at the coal company alone. Um, but then on, uh, I guess I could point you to, um, there's a page in my slide deck that talks about the other jobs that um, I'm sorry. Take your time. If you look at page five in my slide deck, it's called local economic benefits. These are just off the top of my head, companies in the area that the coal company does business with. So talk about buying heavy equipment, tires, mechanics, welders, fuel, um, engineers, explosive companies, um, hardware stores, restaurants, signage, um, uh, rail, rail service. Our, the coal tipple is on R.J. Corman Railroad, so a lot of the coal is shipped by rail. Uh, these, these are just some examples of how you could improve the economy. And if you look at a town like Phillipsburg, when it was, um, when it was a coal town, that's what supported the economy of the town. And when coal company went away, everything went away. So car dealerships close, you know, the shirt factory closes, 
restaurants close, that sort of thing. Do you have any sense in terms of like what is the the number, the, the economic impact number? Or I, I, I don't sitting here today. That's something that I would like to be able to answer, and perhaps through this process we can find the resources to help answer it. Sure. Um, because I think that would be a, a good metric to know. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to welcome our colleague, Representative Mursky, here to the hearing. We, we understand it was uh, not as rough as Philadelphia, but still a little rough out there. So <laughs> when it comes to traffic, I should it's probably quantify. Construction season in uh, northwest Pennsylvania is um, quite, I didn't account for the time, and I apologize. <laughs> well, we're grateful that you're here um, I, and just want to follow up uh, with a question. So, so really, our committee is, is tasked with reviewing and selecting legacy projects, infrastructure improvements, and, and other similar projects that are designed to welcome regional, national, and even international tourists here to Pennsylvania. Um, the hope is they're going to come in and see the Liberty Bell, Independence Hall, and then they're going to come west and see the rest of what Pennsylvania has to offer. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this project could welcome those people here to, to this part of Pennsylvania? Yeah, I would, I would say there are three things that it could do. Uh, one, it's going to improve the environment. And so while Phillipsburg has Coldstream, um, Recreation Area and Mishannon, uh, or Black Mishannon State Park, which are fishable places. Um, Coldstream also has a diversion stream that runs sulfur water around it and back into the Mishannon Creek. And so cleaning up that area um, will allow for you know, better recreation, uh, a place where people want to come. They won't look around saying, well, why is the water all mucky and orange? Things like that. Um, secondly, it will improve the economy so that people actually have somewhere to visit. If you go to Phillipsburg right now, what are you going to do? There are some things to do, but you know we, could ha we have a lot of vacant buildings. And so you people are going to visit a town. They want to do something there, and we have to give them something to do. And that can't just be tourist-based. We, be, we have to have a local economy to support it. And the third thing is um, I, I was sort of thinking of like um, the big dig when I came up with this. If you remember the tunnel that they dug under the Boston Harbor, you know, and it, it kind of became a, like a thing of national attention. And so I was thinking that this could be a point of um, sort of pride uh, for the town and for the state. Uh, and it could be a um, model for other uh, environmental reclamation projects in, the, in, the Pens in Pennsylvania and in the US, and that that might bring people here to study what we're doing so they can do it somewhere else. Very good. Well, I thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Rusnak? We thank you very much thank for your testimony and presentation here today. Thank you. I'm going to excuse myself because I have a meeting about this project with the DEP at 2 o'clock. <laughs> we <laughs> wish you the okay. very best. Thank you. <laughs> Our next testifier we'd like to welcome is Tom Fountaine from the Borough of State College. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you very much. You may proceed. The opportunity. Very good. So we're here today to talk to you about the State College Next Era PSU project which stands for Pedestrian Safety and Universal Accessibility Initiative. Uh, this project is a series of transportation enhancements, infrastructure improvements in Calderway and Downtown State College. Downtown State College is bordered on the north by Penn State University, uh, the main campus, and it's an economic hub of, of Center County. Downtown State College is home to over 350 businesses with a diverse mix of retail, professional, personal services, restaurants, hotels, and other tourism supporting businesses. 
The strength of downtown's retail market alone is over $442 million in annual value. This value is at risk as is future job growth through firm attraction if State College cannot address impending infrastructure failures. This project is truly a generational project. Significant inv investment in business retention and recruitment through the borough's partnership with Invent Penn State led to the construction of the Eric J. Barron Innovation Hub, an 85,000 square foot PSU facility that houses the Invent Penn State's Happy Valley launch box by PNC Bank and that has opened the way for the State College Town Center project, a P3 project to proceed to construction later this year or early next year. Moreover, KCF Technologies, a startup technology company headquartered in downtown State College, plans to hire more staff within the next 10 years. The Center County Economic Development Partnership has invested in the KCF growth in downtown State College, a uh, partnership consisting of State College, College Township, Patton Township, Ferguson Township, and Center County that has made a significant investment to assist KCF Technologies to grow its employment base here in State College. This new development relies on Calder Way infrastructure to, to successfully function. Calder Way serves as a utility uh, corridor and provides access for stormwater, electric, telecommunications, water, and sanitary sewer lines. If you've been here during the Arts Festival in recent years, you may have witnessed water main breaks in Calder Way that disrupted the Arts Festival, in fact, and which really move this project to uh, a higher priority for us to complete. The uh, uh, Calder Way also provides one-way access for passenger vehicles, delivery vehicles, trash removal, pedestrians, and cyclists. And the vi vision for Calder Way is to function as a shared space to accommodate all modes of transportation. The project will provide safety, comfort, and connectivity for pedestrians and cyclists while upgrading the significantly aged infrastructure and moving utilities underground for environmental sustainability and increased resiliency to natural disasters. The project supports the integrated land use, economic development, and transportation planning to improve the movements of people, goods, local fiscal health, and assist in the continued stabilization of downtown State College. The infrastructure improvements in Calder Way will support the proposed new commercial uses and development as recent growth has taxed the existing sewer system and increased capacity in the sewer system is really needed to support this new commercial development. The project will consist uh, of on-road facilities for pedestrians, bicyclists, and other non-motorized forms of transportation, including sidewalks, traffic calming, pedestrian lighting, and ADA improvements. The project will also upgrade all infrastructure, relocate electrical and telecommunication lines below grade, install EV level three charging stations in the three public parking garages in downtown State College. And we know this project will result in real benefits, including a 67% reduction in annual pedestrian and vehicle crashes, 43.2 million annual vehicle miles avoided, 18.5 million in health and mortality reduction benefits over the project lifestyle. And I have a pamphlet that I didn't bring today, but I will uh, circulate it to the committee after this hearing today so that you have some basis for understanding those numbers and what the project will accomplish. This next uh, segment of the project is, is uh, bu budgeted at $17,350,307. The borough has submitted both state and federal grants to help offset the, pro the cost of the project and intends to cover the pre-construction cost totaling $720,000. The borough is requesting $2.5 million of legacy PA, 250 PA rather, funding for this vital project, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present this testimony today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Representative Solomon. Thank you, Tom. Um, you know, I think that the, the center made a really good point about how these different regional projects sort of work together. And when we were in York, and I think it was the, maybe the Historical Society, was talking about um, how they plan to sort of make this a commonwealth experience where they're gonna link up to Pittsburgh and Philly and everywhere in between. What, how do you see 
this linking up with other regions? I mean, it, how is it? Is it a corridor tour? What, what are the historic points? Are you gonna are you gonna welcome people with a particular with with some kind of a, a, a welcome to this area, providing the historical background. What do you see happening in 2026? Well, pr probably all of the above. This uh, State College itself is a tourist destination uh, with Penn State University and the seven or eight or nine major events that occur here that draw over 100,000 peoples from all over the, the Commonwealth as well as the, the, uh, the entire country. Uh, and this project will create a safe pedestrian experience for those visitors to State College. If you uh, are familiar at all with Calder Way, you know it is very difficult to navigate uh, through that corridor. Uh, it's, uh, it's curbs and, and overhead electric and telephone lines. Uh, we intend to relocate the, uh, w the garbage collection, the refuse collection underground so that we don't clog the right of way with those kinds of, of facilities. We, uh, look at moving all of those other utilities underground as well and really creating in downtown State College a pedestrian uh, experience that will be much more welcoming and encourage people from all over not only to come for for those seven or eight or nine events each year but to come back and visit consistently from all parts of Pennsylvania and frankly uh, from other parts of the country. Um, Cassandra. Thanks, Tom. I just have a quick question regarding, um, so in your proposal, you mentioned creation of about 10,000 jobs, which is a significant amount of jobs. Can you talk a little bit more about that and where it says over a 10-year period? Yeah, that the, the, it's an estimate. We don't know for sure, but it's based on what we have been doing in downtown State College with businesses like KCF, other businesses that are part of that economic development partnership to increase employment in downtown State College that is not specifically Penn State related, but brings uh, a more diverse economy to the region here. We experienced over the past three years, uh, particularly in, the, in 2020 and 21, 2021, um, some challenges because we are so dependent on Penn State. We appreciate that and we, we have a great partnership with Penn State, but we also wanna grow jobs that are not tied directly to Penn State. And we, we think this project really helps us to, develop, to begin to develop the infrastructure to make it a safer, uh, more appealing environment for those businesses. Thank you. Hmm. Representative Takak. Take it. Take Ak. Take Ak. Take Ak. Yeah, All right. I answer We've to a lot of things. We've never served together um, before, so <laughs> thank you. Okay. I, as someone whose name is routinely uh, mispronounced, I'm very sensitive to that. So it, it, take is. It, it is. Thank you very much, Senator. Appreciate that. Um, not sure that I really have as much of a question. I mean, I'm very familiar, of course, with the borough and this project mm -hmm. and, and many of the things that are going. But I just wanted to say that one of the things that makes uh, State College Borough, the center region, frankly, the, the entire county in, in central Pennsylvania, is such a great place to live is the quality and talent of our local elected officials. And in my opening comments, I neglected to mention a couple of whom are here in the audience. So I'd like to recognize uh, Mayor Ezra Nains Thank you. And, uh, and Council President Jesse Barlow, um, both of whom, uh, in particular Mayor Nains, have championed um, pedestrian and bike safety and access and infrastructure, not only in State College Borough, but across the center region. And that has had profound effects on local pedestrian facilities and master plans and those kind of things. So um, I, I missed his recent mayoral bike ride uh, because I was out of town, but uh, this is a, an important local issue. And, you know, again, the the question of how that ties into America 250 PA. Um, I, I appreciate you being here. So thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. And thank you for uh, bailing me out on that too, Representative Takak. I intended to introduce them and I totally forgot since I didn't have it written in my notes. So thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? I 
very good. Very good. Thank I you very much. Appreciate it very much. Uh, much like Eric, I also have to leave, so thank you for getting me on early and appreciate uh, very much the opportunity to present. Uh, looking forward to talking more about this project and others. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Mark you. For your work. Next up, we have David Kovach, the Stewart Tank Memorial Association. David. And of course, uh, David is a commissioner of Columbia County. Good afternoon. I am Dave Kovach, president of the Stewart Tank Memorial Association. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you today. Well, the Stewart Tank Memorial Association is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation founded in 2015. Our mission is to honor the 9,135 workers from 177 communities throughout <coughs> Northeastern Pennsylvania who produced 15,224 Stewart light tanks at the American Carn Foundry in Berwick. We also honor all World War II veterans. The American Carn Foundry workers came from as far away as Clark Summit, Dushore, Williamsport, Sealand Grove, and New Tripoli. The association has an all -volunteer organi is an all-volunteer organization. In addition to our museum, we do historical presentations at schools, service organizations, and at public events. When students are in the audience, we highlight STEM education, engineering, manufacturing, science, chemistry, and mathematics as applied to the design, manufacture, and operation of the Stewart Tank. In keeping with our mission to educate the public, all of our events and presentations are free admission. We, we are funded by donations and grants. The Stewart Tank is just not a significant part of the history of Burwick. It also played a significant role in the history of the United States and world history. The Stewart Tank was the first U.S. tank designed to function independently with a top speed of 35 miles an hour. Previous tanks were designed specifically for infantry support and had a top speed of nine miles an hour. The M2A4 was the first U.S. military tank to be built on the assembly line. Previous U.S. tanks were individually manufactured at various ar U.S. arsenals, particularly the Rock Island Arsenal. The M3 was the first tank included in the Lend-Lease program as part of the arsenal of democracy. The Stuart tank was utilized by all ally armies in, in all the theaters North Africa, Europe, Asia, Pacific, including Alaska and Antarctica. We're not sure what that one was doing in Antarctica, but there was, there's one there. <laughs> uh, the ACF Burwick was the largest producer of armor plate at the time, producing at least 10% of all armor plate for the U.S. military. Every armored vehicle produced for the U.S. during World War II utilized at least some armor plate. One out of every eight vehicles produced for the war were built at the Burwick ACF. The ACF plant was the only manufacturer at the time with its own ballistic, ballistic testing range. All other manufacturers were required to ship their products to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland for testing. The American Car and Foundry, Burwick, Pennsylvania, was selected by Hitler as one of 19 targets for his America, America bomber program. During World War II, the American Car and Foundry Burwick 
produced millions of bomb casings, artillery shells, and hundreds of railway cars, and over 21,000 D7 caterpillar, caterpillar trackers. The Stewart Memorial Association obtained a 1942 M3A1 tank in 2015, and in 1945, we were able to find a D7 tractor in, in 2017. We also have a 35-foot 30, a 30 trailer that was made and donated for us to haul our tank to uh, parades and other events. Currently, all these items are shuffled from one location to another wherever we can find free storage. We are currently restoring our M3A1 tank at a rented spot <clears throat> 20 minutes from our museum and the tracker, <clears throat> the tracker also needs some restoration. The maintenance and storage facility will be a 70 by 30 foot pole building with a 16 foot ceiling. There will be two 14 foot high overhead doors with reinforced concrete uh, flooring. The estimated cost is $151,000. This includes plumbing, electrical, and HVAC. It does not include a number of other items, but if we are able to get the building, we will be able to take care of those items. <clears throat> and the property itself will be leased from the borough of Berwick for a dollar a year for the next 99 years. The maintenance storage facility will be only five minutes from our museum and is centrally located for all of our volunteers. The facility will be located at the Test Track Park where we hold our World War II event. The facility will allow us to store all of our equipment, our tank, and props for our, at, that we have at our site. Uh, Fred Shepterly, who was a Burrick man, was a parts manager at the ACF when the Marines received their first Stuart tank ever, first, first tank ever. The Marines needed someone to, with knowledge, of the Stuart tank and Fred volunteered. He wrote the operating and maintenance manuals for the Stuart tank. Captain Fred Shepherdly recruited 100 men from the Burwick factory and they served as the Marine Corps Armor Maintenance and Repair Company in the Pacific Theater for two and a half years. This maintenance building will be dedicated in their honor for what they did during World War II. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Do any of my colleagues have questions for the commissioner? Good. A absolutely. Representative. Thank you very much for being here. It looks like a <laughs> great place to visit. Yeah. Can you um, describe what's currently in the museum? And is there not room in the museum for the tank? I'm just a little curious. I've not had, having not been there myself. We have one or two problems, maybe two. We either have too much stuff or our building's too small. Sounds familiar. Uh, the, building, the building was actually a grant from our local foundation. And it took a while, but we were able to figure it out and re redo it uh, because we actually have two Stuart tanks now. One of those tanks is in our museum. So we are so very fortunate because the museum is now all full of donations from people, all of local people, people that we don't know. Uh, at our event, we've had people come walking up to us and say, here's a head of said lights for your tank. I don't need them anymore. You need them. It, we've just been so fortunate. And I could talk for hours about how when we started to where we're at now. And it's all about honoring what we're, our whole purpose for being here is to honor all the people that built, fought, and died with the Stuart Tank. Uh, our museum's been open for just over a year. And we've had over 2,000 people to come and visit. They're finding out about us. On, we're trying to get out on every website and uh, TikTok, wherever the digital world goes, uh, but they're finding out about us, and it, we've we found out that there's a lot of people that are interested in World War II and what happened here, and this happened in my hometown. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm very involved. Well. Uh,
Well, I'm glad to know that it's been open less than a year, so I haven't missed it for very long. Oh, no. Okay, oh. but I will be there. Oh. Thank you. And we'd, we'd love to have you all come and visit. We'd, that would be wonderful. Um. Director Col Coleman. Thank you, Senator. You're welcome. <laughs> Commissioner, um, one point, a, a comment and then a question, but a comment is, as long as I've known you, which has been a very long time now, um, the commissioner has been uh, you know, very passionate about this project, and I did have the honor of attending the opening last yeah. year. Um, it's a wonderful facility, um, and that's, you know, they, they got to that point because of all your hard work, so I do commend you because you are passionate, and we understand how passionate you are about that, so thanks for, thanks yeah. for the testimony. Um, question, do you have I know, again, it's only been open to the year, but do you have a number of, of visitors of how many have, have come through this year? This year, no. All I know is the, since it's been open, we've had 2,000. Okay. And we do have a guest book uh, that a lot of the people have signed, so you can come and, you can come and see that. And you track where they're from, too. Oh, That's how yeah, you do that. We, we ask them to sign it and please put down where they're from. Uh, they're coming from near and far. Uh, we've they've been from a number of other countries also. Uh, they're finding out about it. So then when they're there, they get to do other things in Columbia County. Uh, a big one is like Knoebels Grove. You might have heard of that. Free parking, free admission, uh, right, all that. And I, I could talk for hours. So just real quick. So this all started in the July of 2004, right after I became commissioner. I'm at an event in Bloomsburg and I run into my good friend Tom that I graduated with, and I asked him this cold question, because up until then I didn't really have any, I, I knew that they were made there, but I didn't have any burning desire. And I said, hey Tom, I got a new job, I'm gonna be home for a little bit more now, because I was a waterproofer before. I said, how would you like to help me bring home a, a tank, a Burrick tank? And he said, well, let me think about it, and like three minutes later he said, yeah, okay. Some days he might regret that, but. In the 19 years that we've been here, we've come so far, so fortunate. And again, it's all about honoring all those people that help us to, so that we could be here today because Hitler didn't get to come over and bomb us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Any other questions? Well, having spent a lot of time in my childhood <laughs> in the booming metropolis of Forks, <laughs> it's... Um, it was very nice to meet you, and I have to thank you for sharing those wonderful memories with me um, and appreciate your testimony here today. Thank, thank you, you all so very much. much. Thank okay. you. So our next testifier here today is Sue Hannigan. She is from the Roland Curtin Foundation for the Preservation of Eagle Furnace. Yep. And with that, Sue, take it away. Yes. Thank you very much and good afternoon, committee members, um, state and elected officials who are here along with their staff, uh, the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau uh, staff and members and other applicants as well and friends. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share the Roland Curtin Foundation's proposal for an America 250 PA infrastructure improvement project. The project supports the expansion of rail side amenities at Eagle Ironworks and Curtin Village, a historic site currently administered by the nonprofit all volunteer Roland Curtin Foundation for the preservation of Eagle Furnace and located in Boggs Township, Center County. I serve as the president of the foundation. Eagle Iron Works was established in 1810 by our foundation's namesake, Irish immigrant Roland Curtin. After arriving in Philadelphia in 1795, Roland settled in central Pennsylvania and became the patriarch of five generations of Curtin iron masters who constructed, expanded, and operated the Eagle Iron Plantation for more than a century. The property is uniquely equipped to tell the story of the rise of central Pennsylvania's leading industry before the Civil War within the Juniata Iron District. Charcoal iron produced at Eagle Ironworks contributed to the building of Pennsylvania and the nation, including its extensive rail transportation network. During its peak years in the 1830s and 1840s, the Juniata Iron District contributed half of all iron made in Pennsylvania and one-fifth of the nation's output. 
Eagle Iron Works' phenomenal 112-year history made it the longest lived and last operating charcoal iron works in Pennsylvania and possibly the entire country. The site is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Among Roland Curtin's sons was Pennsylvania Civil War Governor Andrew Gregg Curtin, who served as the governor from 1861 to 1867 and was a friend and political ally of President Abraham Lincoln throughout the Civil War. Governor Curtin was instrumental in the efforts to rally the Northern governor's support to preserve the Union, was the moving force behind the establishment of the National Cemetery in Gettysburg in 1863, and his invitation to Lincoln to address the crowd at the cemetery's dedication resulted in Lincoln's famous delivery of the Gettysburg Address. Preserving and interpreting Eagle Ironworks in Curtin Village will become the sole responsibility of the Roland Curtin Foundation in the near future. The proposed $1.9 million project for the reconstruction of the company store, the railroad station, and the rail siding has significant potential to enhance the visitor experience, strengthen visitation, support programs and events, and diversify income generation. To be sustainable, we, the foundation, must find innovative, family-friendly, history-based approaches to generate visitor interest that result in increased income. The company store has potential for interpretation, events, and retail income. The station will become the gateway to and the visitor center for the Eagle Ironworks site, and the rail siding will provide a safe location for passenger access while permitting freight service to continue uninterrupted. Grant assistance will be essential for completion of this endeavor. In keeping with the intent of America 250 PA, we embrace this opportunity to expand our infrastructure and interpretation of significant Pennsylvania history with the hope that we can inspire others to view Eagle Ironworks and Curtin Village as a place to explore connections to our past and find relevance for places in history that matter by doing so, the Roland Curtin Foundation will strive to embrace the stories of the people who lived and worked the land owned by the Curtin family, including in indigenous peoples, immigrants from Western European countries, and those who arrived at Curtin from slavery, who together as a community innovated an industrial process that contributed significantly to the building of America. The nonprofit Roland Curtin Foundation for the Preservation of Eagle Furnace is organized, quote, to promote interest and participation in the management, operation, preservation, restoration, and exhibition of Eagle Furnace, Ironworks, Curtin Village, Curtin Mansion, and the properties related to the historical site and operation, unquote. It was incorporated in 1966 and continues to offer visitors rare views into the lives and labors of central Pennsylvanians who helped propel the region into the forefront of American iron production in the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you very much. For questions, Representative Takek. Did I get that right this time? Yes, you did, absolutely. Making progress here. No, thank you very much, Senator, appreciate that. And Sue, thank you for being here and to other members of the board who are here as well. Appreciate your support. You know, I think one of the things, having been on the site several times, what's really remarkable, and you, you said it, but, but that this isn't just a single facility. This is the whole plantation. It is the, the house. It's the industrial facility. It's the worker housing. It's, it's mm -hmm. all the above, the canal and things. I noticed that in your packet you have a little site map. I wonder if I could direct um, fellow committee members to this this map, and if you could just speak real quickly about the different components of the site and why this is such a unique preservation of, of this uh, industry in particular. Yes, so um, the site is quite large. There are 10 acres of the site that are owned currently by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. There are 150 acres owned by the Army Corps of Engineers with buildings on them that are owned by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. All of that, those properties are intended to transfer to the Roland Curtin Foundation in the near future. They include the managerial section um, of which we refer to as where Roland Curtin's mansion is located, as well as the manager's house, which was the fifth generation uh, Iron Master's home. So there are two Iron Master's homes on the property. 
Nearby them um, is a barn, which served as a stable. Uh, horses were very popular there in the 20th century, so they had a, a stable just for, for horses. Uh, carriage House has been redone um, to provide a catering kitchen operation there to support programs that we currently have. Um, once we re walk away from the manager's area or the, the Iron Master's residential area, we come to the industrial complex, which on your map, and I have other copies here perhaps I should distribute to everyone because they are a bit larger while I'm speaking, but then you won't be able to hear me. <laughs> So I will stay put. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, and when we get to that industrial complex, that's where the iron furnace is located with all the components of an iron furnace available for visitors to tour. Now that includes, and there was a picture included with your um, testimony, it not only includes the furnace stack, which is where they um, inserted the fuel and the iron ore in order to make the iron, but it includes the charging house, which is where they fed the furnace from the top. It includes the casting house where the iron was, molten iron was drawn off every 12 hours, twice a day, seven days a week, well, six days a week. They gave Sundays off, 365 days a year, essentially. It was a nonstop operation. Um, and then we also have the blast house, which was needed in order to um, um, generate the air needed, the cold air needed to fuel and keep the fire burning uh, that was done with charcoal. So that blast house has a overshot water wheel in it. It operates two piston operated bellows that um, force the air into a central box and that cold air is then forced into the furnace to increase the temperature um, by burning the charcoal at a higher temperature. It took almost 2,500 degrees, 2,800 degrees to smelt iron from the iron ore that was included. And then across the road from there, we get to the workers' village where we have a log cabin um, that is open for tours. Uh, Mr. Dukeman's home is there. Mr. Dukeman was the blacksmith. Many generations of Dukemans were blacksmiths at the uh, iron furnace. There's a boarding house. The foreman's house is there as well. And uh, associated and located right beside the furnace, which you can see on your map, is um, lock number 11 of the Bald Eagle and Spring Creek Navigation Canal. So this, this furnace stayed in operation until 19, furnace until 1921. The Eagle Iron Works until 1922 which made it the longest operating charcoal-fired coal blast furnace uh, in Pennsylvania, if not the nation. But part of the reason why it was so successful was because it had the transportation uh, mechanisms to get their products to market. So in 1848, when the canal was opened uh, to Curtin, um, the Curtins also built the furnace right beside the canal. And then in the 1860s, when the railroad was opened, uh, that became the major means of transporting product at that time. So that contributed to its long success as well. <coughs> Representative Mursky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. Um, I do have a question. I, in terms of the, the funding, one to 2.5 million, without this funding, how does this project look different? Um, and, and conversely, with this funding, how did you see um, the preservation of Eagle Furnace uh, being more successful? The components that are included in this proposal today were there at the property in, in its time of history. Uh, there was a railroad station there, a company store uh, were there, and a siding. Um, the goal was to reconstruct those. Uh, those parts are missing. But more than that, um, the railroad station alone will provide the gateway to the site and become the visitor center. At the present time, we really don't have a visitor center for all of these components. So that's very important to us, that we have a place where visitors can first arrive by train, hopefully, <laughs> at some point in the future, as well as just driving in and walking in. Um, but they will be able to view an orientation video uh, that would then be available in the train station. So how does it look different? Um, if we did not go forward with this site, we would be cobbling together as we currently are 
um, striving to provide uh, a visitor experience uh, that is worthy of definitely visiting because it is the last operating charcoal-fired furnace in Pennsylvania. But um, the beauty of having these things, it will enhance the visitor's uh, experience and it will generate, we believe, much more visitation to the site um, because there is an awful lot of interest in rail excursions and rail to, um, to Curtin Village. Absolutely. Do you have an estimate on how many visitors this, this could increase um, attendance? Um, we have read through economic development studies and found that um, the thing that really increases the visitation by rail is if we have events. We're looking forward to that first event, hopefully in the near future, regardless of not having the siding in place um, at this time. And we anticipate that there will be hundreds of people there. And for, um, for each visitor, um, that arrives at an event. It supports eight additional jobs. Um, and so we're thinking that uh, with rail excursion potential to come to Curtin, that that will increase visitation, increase more tourism in Center County, and create more jobs. I will definitely need to create a job for the Roland Curtin Foundation. Uh, currently, we're all volunteers, but we do believe we're going to need a full-time, part-time uh, event coordinator. So Thank you. Any further questions? Very good. Thank you so much Thank for your you. testimony here mm -hmm. today. Next up, we have Andrew Richard, who is representing the Center County Commissioners. The other way around. <laughs> Let me try that again. The Center County Commissioners on behalf of Andrew Richard to discuss the uh, Belfont Historic Historical Railroad Society. Hello, I'm uh, Center County Commissioner Mark Higgins. This is Commissioner Amber Concepcion. Uh, welcome to Happy Valley. We appreciate you coming. Although Paul didn't have to travel very far. Um, I'd like to um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, Center County has historically made major contributions to Pennsylvania and the United States of America. Five of Pennsylvania governors came from Belfont, literally every other governor between 1848 and 1900. Um, plus two additional governors, governors for other states, uh, Governor Andrew Curtin, I think you heard that word just a minute ago, uh, was Pennsylvania's Civil War governor and a close friend of President Abraham Lincoln's. Uh, Bullsburg, uh, just around the corner from here, is the birthplace of Memorial Day and home of multiple U.S. ambassadors. Uh, I will speak about uh, a, a great local nonprofit that serves much of the geography of Center County. It's the uh, Belfont Historical Rail Society. It's a historical society working to preserve railroad history here in Center County, and they offer train rides and events that focus on rail. Uh, for many years, the Belfont Historic uh, Railroad offered two weekends of passenger excursions from the Belfont train station, the fall foliage, and the incredibly popular Santa Express train rides. They sold 4,000 tickets in two hours every year. Just in two weekends alone, they generated $100,000 of revenue. Um, these rides were provided through a collaboration of the BHRS, the CETACOG uh, Joint Rail Authority, the North Shore Railroad, and the Penn Valley uh, Railroad. Currently, they're offering uh, speeder car rides during major festivals from both Talleyrand Park in downtown Belfont and the Lamont Granary about a mile from here. Um, they maintain a section of historic railroad track, also about a mile from here, and they're working to preserve historic uh, railroad equipment and infrastructure. Uh, the BHRS has access to the CETACOG Joint Rail Authority-owned track that runs from Tyrone um, in um, uh, toward, uh, toward Altoona, um, and then all the way over to Lock Haven. So this is actually a three-county service area um, between Blair, Center, and Clinton counties, uh, and they also connect um, in Milesburg to Belfont and Lamont. Um, this line connects numerous historic locations in Center County, from the Lamont Granary, uh, the historic uh, downtown Belfont, uh, the old Bald Eagle and Spring Creek Navigation Company Canal, historic and tourism sites along the entire uh, Bald Eagle Valley, which again spans three counties, uh, the Bald Eagle State Park and iron furnaces, including the Curtin Village at Eagle Ironworks Historic Site, which is a unique and well-preserved large uh, iron plantation 
operated by Roland Curtin and his family from 1810 to 1921. It was the last uh, operating coal-fueled iron furnace in Pennsylvania. Now, the rail line um, into Lamont, uh, where uh, Paul lives, was built by the Pennsylvania Railroad in the late 1800s to serve freight and passengers in the Penns Valley and Happy Valley areas of Center County. This line uh, provided service to Penn State and connected this region to the National Rail Network when uh, railroads were about the only way you could move around the country quickly. Uh, railroads helped build communities across the United States and connected the nation with fast, reliable service, strengthening the bonds of our newly forming nation. Uh, preserving that infrastructure in smaller communities not only links us to the past, but maintains a corridor for future transportation needs. Uh, this project serves local transportation and tourism and would affect local members of the community by improving uh, a, ro a, a road and railroad crossing on a well-traveled local road and maintaining that rail crossing to be used by the uh, tourist railroad which affects uh, both locals and out-of-area families for fun, learning, tourism, and recreation. The primary impact of this initial thirty dollars to $50,000 project would be in preserving the tourist attraction that draws tourism dollars to local businesses across multiple Center County municipalities. Uh, during construction, the project would employ five to six people and would entail removing the old uh, rail and ties where the Mount Nittany Road crosses the tracks. They'd put in new ballast ties and rails and a wooden flange guard uh, and then repave the area. A future grant should focus on the purchase of up to three historic passenger rail cars to accommodate the Santa Express and fall foliage excursions. An estimate for this grant would be roughly an additional 300,000. Um, these projects would help strengthen the tourism and recreation communities in Center County. Well, thank you for hearing my testimony. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Concepcion for some brief remarks. Hi, thank you all. I think one of the things I'd like to emphasize most is the educational impact of having this um, kind of rail connection. Not only could families and children experience the, what it would have been like to travel on historical rail cars, but by connecting them to these historical sites, um, we are improving the extent to which members of our community value and are aware of the history in these sites. They learn about the history. Um, it's going to um, really improve the extent to which we are, have this buy-in to maintain our history locally. So, and it, it's in connection with a lot of other projects going on um, in regard to those sites. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, I, so this price tag of 29610 for that dollar amount, what will you, what will you see that, it, that is different from how this actually looks today? Right, so the 29610 was an actual quote uh, from a company to repair that intersection, but it was from a little time ago, so it's p possible. Sounds low. Might run a little yeah. more. Um, but uh, in Lamont, there is a train station right in their small downtown, and this intersection is roughly two blocks before that train station, and it's very difficult to, at this point, actually get a full-size train to come to the train station without the improvement of this particular intersection. So you repair it, and then the full-size train hopefully yes. can move go, through go that all intersection. The way to the actual train station, which is uh, what, Paul, a mile and a half out of downtown State College? Uh, and there is local parking there. Yeah, not even that far. Not even that far. Goes through your house, right, Paul? <laughs> 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 Luckily not. Yes. So that's phase one. And yes. wh then what, what is phase two, and phase how much does that yes. cost? Phase two would be the purchase of up to three uh, historic railroad passenger cars, uh, which would run um, the cars, the rehabbing, the transportation of said cars, roughly in the ballpark of $300,000. The difficulty for the Belfont Historic Rail Society is right now they have to rent the rail cars. And oh, so, so you don't have one? They don't. They have one car that's currently in the process of being shipped here. They need about three more. Uh, and right now they have to rent those rail cars. And so they'll pull in $100,000 of ticket revenue. They'll get to keep 40000 of that. And so they're basically, this is a labor of love for them right is now. Is that a historic car that they're renting to, th to bring yes. here, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. so that'll, that would be used if this w we could do these repairs? Uh, um, potentially, yes. The, okay. the difficulties, if any of you serve on transportation committees, there's recently been some technical changes to federal rail rules that you can't actually transport historic rail cars on main lines anymore, uh, except at huge expense. So, yeah, unfortunately, unless there's a change in the federal rules, uh, the Belfont Historic Rail Society will have a historic rail car 
and that's all they're going to have. And so this would be a total, total all in, a two phase project yes. costing about $330,000. Correct. Got it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Other questions, comments? Representative Takak. Thank you. Uh, not, not so much a comment, and I don't want to preempt any of the other testimony, but I just really wanted to highlight that just down the hill from where we are right now is, is the Lamont village, and yes. there's a very active historical society. Uh, there's a historic district there. There's a granary that has been reconstructed that hosts events now. In fact, if anyone would like to stick around, they're having their first concert series tonight. Yeah. It yeah. starts on the adjacent green. Uh, it's a weekly event. They host a German Christmas festival that draws in people from all over. Uh, that's at one end of this, this proposed historic railroad connection. That then goes into historic Belfont, which, you know, it's, Victorian bed and breakfast, they do the Victorian Christmas, it's the home of governors, it's just a remarkable place if you haven't been to Belfont. And then it would continue there out into the valley to the Roland Curtin planta Ironworks Plantation um, and out to Bald Eagle State Park. I mean, it really showcases the mining, the lumber, the history, the agriculture, the railroad, all of that. And I, I neglected to mention that down at this end, too, we're in very close proximity to Penn State. We're in very close proximity to Bullsburg, which, as you mentioned, is the home of the uh, Memorial Day, but it's also the home of the Pennsylvania Military Museum, which is the official repository of Pennsylvania artifacts and, and interpretation, part of the Museum and Historical Society. Uh, there's the Bull Mansion. There's so many neighborhoods and areas that are listed in the National Registry, uh, historical markers. It's just such a rich history. And I think the vision is that this rail would connect all of that. And not only would it do it for 2026, but what it would do is, is contribute to the economic civic, cultural, educational vitality of this area, tying all those together for, for years to come. So I don't want to preempt the vision or, or the details of anybody else, but to me this is, I, I just really wanted to underscore why I think this is so important. So thank you for being here to tell that story. Perfectly said, Paul. And, um, Commissioner Conception and I have been working closely with our tourism promotion agency, the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau, to tie all of our assets together. We have a lot of historic assets here in Center County, uh, and it's been working so well that uh, Belfont had its uh, last hotel burned down several decades ago, uh, and now we have two hotels uh, in the announced planning stages and possibly a third one eventually coming along. Um, so we've got a lot of um, jobs here in Center County that are tied to tourism, not just Penn State fo football. Center County and Happy Valley is way more than just Penn State football. If I may, yeah. Commissioners, thank you for your testimony here today. And um, rail was very important in the founding of our Commonwealth. And we find that our small boroughs and towns are now seeing a revitalization around yeah those rails, and it's exciting. Uh, the previous testifier, Ms. Hannigan, talked about the work uh, being done um, at the, the Curtin Farm, village. Yes. the plantation, Curtin Village, um, and the old ironworks. Yes. Your rail lines connect in there. Yes. So this project that you're putting forward and the one that our previous testifier spoke to, can you talk about the interconnectivity of sure. those two projects. Certainly. So our long-range vision, which uh, Paul was uh, expressing very eloquently, is that you can have uh, people come to Center County and they can go to Lamont, a little more than a mile from the campus of Penn State, park there, board some historic railroad cars, go to Belfont, which is a gorgeous community. For those of you on the east side of the state, it's Jim Thorpe with adequate parking. Um, so we have beautiful brick buildings, beautiful historic structures, numerous restaurants, numerous adult beverage establishments. Um, one of the cideries in Belfont won the Governor's Cup two years ago. Uh, our distillery in Belfont won the Governor's Cup two of the last three years for the quality of their product. 
uh, and then you can continue on with a short train ride to the Roland Curtin Foundation and see essentially a fully operational iron furnace that is charcoal fired. It's the only place in the entire state, possibly the nation, where you can see that. So this will extend your ability yes. um, and the lines that yes. you can ride when you come here to visit. Because right now, historically, there were two weekends when you could do this, and currently uh, there are zero weekends when you can do this. Uh, a, a 10 or 15 mile long speeder car ride is not always enjoyable for most mm -hmm. people, whereas a passenger rail car, it's very nice. Indeed. Yeah. When, we had, um, the when we had that rail functioning, um, Truly, the tickets were sold out within an hour or two of when they would go on sale. And for families in the area, getting those tickets, it was like Taylor Swift tickets. You know, it was really a competitive, <laughs> yeah, that comparison highly sought after. <laughs> yes, you know, it was, yeah, you had to be on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. Thank yeah. you for, for helping yeah. us to conceptualize that. Any further questions? David with Brandon Hall. Mr. Sneal? I just wanted to mention we had some recent interaction uh, back and forth and Representative Benninghoff is in total support of the historic aspects, uh, everything that you're speaking of um, and he hopes to be able to do more. He's always keeping his eyes open, his ears open uh, as far as funding and what's, you know, uh, available. Um, so he's definitely in your corner. Um, so, you know, just stay tuned on that and, you know, be patient. He'll, he'll continue to do what he can. Thank you. You're welcome. We thank you very much for your testimony yeah, here today. Yeah, really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank, thank you. you. We would now like to welcome our next testifier, Mary Sorensen from the Center County Historical Society. Thank you for being here. I know you've brought other people along with you. If you'd like to introduce them, we'd welcome that. And I think I'm going to let Roger go first. Roger's our president of this historical society. Yes, Roger. I am decidedly not Mary Sorensen. She's right here and she'll be with you in just a second. Well, Roger, if you could just state your name for the record yes. and Roger proceed Williams. with your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Roger Williams, president of the Center County Historical Society, and besides Mary with us today are our property committee chair and project architect, Alan Popovich. Alan, if you would just raise your hand. Well, we are most grateful to uh, all of you on the panel for allowing us this opportunity to come before you today. The proposal that we are putting before you today represents a moonshot for the Center County Historical Society, a true moonshot. If funded, it would be the most consequential development in the long history of our organization since the acquisition of Center Furnace Mansion back in 1978. It would essentially double our scope, scale, and impact with benefits that would last generations for the people we serve and the tourism that we support. Here to tell you more about it is our executive director, Mary. Thank you, Roger, and, and thank you to the, the committee for all of your service and, and work on this. This is wonderful and um, for inviting us here today. Um, the idea for expanding beyond the Center Furnace Mansion to serve the society's mission um, has been on the minds of our leadership for, for decades. The idea began to take shape in 2018 when Chet Esber um, informed us they were considering selling their adjacent property. With recent real estate development in the area, we feel it's critical to, to preserve this property in a way that integrates it with the Center Furnace Mansion. The society proposes in this $6.5 plus million dollar legacy project to purchase the Esper property to establish the new Center for Cultural and Historic Preservation and make improvements to the surrounding landscape. 
Doing so would launch the Historical Society to an entirely new level of programming and service to the people of Center County and the larger visiting public. Reimagining this historic corner in College Township at East College Avenue and Porter Road, just down from Beaver Stadium, we envision its potential in the following ways. As a gateway for visitors to State College and to Penn State that showcases the history of the area in context um, in Pennsylvania. As an expanded center for research and educational programming, as a welcoming site enabling the society to promote local history and tourism, as a park with expanded paths for visitors to discover, explore, and learn. The project would involve acquisition, documentation, structural, evaluation, stabilization, and rehabilitation of the Esper buildings to improve visitor experience and accommodate evolving uses to include expansion of permanent and temporary gallery space, including um, for a period room for the Richard W. Pensick collection of early American decorative arts and furniture, a public library and research room, event program and demonstration space, visual collections, storage, and high-density archival storage, partnership space with the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau, historical society office space, and rental space. Having a master plan and comprehensive historic landscape plan for the property will be essential. Development of the landscape will include ADA, accessible trails, added interpretive signage, outdoor event space, as well as needed repairs for the furnace stack masonry. We are committed to growing the society's reserve funds as an endowment to accommodate our operations as, these, um, as this organization grows. Our revenue streams associated with the project, such as tenant rental, rental of private event space and meeting space factor into this sustainability as well. Our connection to America 250 PA the Historical Society hosts exhibitions, talks, demonstrations, publications that feature history and culture of America and Pennsylvania during the Revolutionary period to current times and will continue to do so. Revolutionary War officers Samuel Miles and John Patton launched Center Furnace in 1791. It was the beginning of the nationally recognized Juniata iron industry, spurring the addition of nearby iron furnaces and forges in the 1790s and beyond. By 1810, the counties of Center, Huntington, and Blair were producing half the iron in the United States. The Center County Historical Society champions all things historical related to Center County's unique past, its mission to collect, interpret, preserve, and promote Center County's cultural and natural heritage. The Center Furnace Mansion and surrounding grounds stand today as a testament to the 18th century origins of the iron industry in Center County and the 19th century founding of the Pennsylvania State University. Listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the Iron Masters Residence, now the Center Furnace Mansion, serves the surrounding communities as a premier historic site, museum, and research center that is visited by over 5,000 annually. And we hope with this project that number will double. Um, I thank you all so much and, and, uh, and offer any, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Questions from my colleagues? Representative Takak. <laughs> you know, I'm going to speak up. <laughs> you know it by now. Thank you so much for being here. And I should mention to other members of the commission, we're sitting not even half a mile, I don't think, down the road from the center furnace mansion and the furnace itself. Um, when people come to to Penn State football, a lot of times they'll, they'll exit and go down College Avenue and they actually turn up Porter Road, which goes in between the mansion and the furnace. So before you leave town, I, I, I would highly encourage you to go there. Today, it's, it's an amazing place to visit. You hold seasonal events, we, you know, the Christmas events, you just recently did the flower sale. I mean, it's, it's a very vibrant part of our community. I also wanted to mention too, College Township has a proposal in place to create a walking um, connection, a pedestrian connection from here all the way into campus, which would actually go right past the mansion and also past the furnace as well to connect campus to this part of town, which is today not easy to do. So I think that would, would tie into this as well. But I really wanted to underscore the relationship of the, the center furnace and the, the proprietors of it to the development of Penn State. And I can't recommend Roger highly enough as an author 
by the way. He is, he's published several books on, on that particular issue and the development of Penn State, and we all know how important that is as the land-grant institution uh, for Pennsylvania and the development uh, continuing to this day of Pennsylvania. And, you know, Mary's amazing staff and volunteers. It's just, it, it's a really um, very worthy part of our history. And by the way, I didn't mean to shortchange you in my earlier uh, comments because I knew you were going to be speaking, but I would throw that in with obviously Lamont and Bullsburg and everything else. So that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for our testifiers? Representative Solomon. Thank you so much for the testimony. You say here the county served Center, Clearfield, Clinton, Blair, Mifflin, Huntington. What, what, what does that exactly mean? Um, really what that means is uh, we work together with all of these county historical societies to share uh, research, to share uh, 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 events, to cross-promote and, and so forth. And so, so with that, we really do reach a larger, uh, a larger community. And um, as, as uh, I sit on the board of the Pennsylvania Museum's um, uh, board as well, and so I know how important it is to, to help promote uh, all of the area, not just our, our own uh, little corner of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. We thank you very much for your testimony here today. Thank you. Next up we have Edward Stoddard and Fritz Smith from the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau. Come on up. Welcome to the fine folks from the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau. <laughs> um, and we welcome your testimony. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and uh, to the representatives who are here, and to Cassandra and your team. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming to our uh, happy home. I'm Fritz Smith. I'm the CEO of the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau, which is the official tourism promotion agency for all of Center County. And my colleague, Ed Stoddard, is the Director of Communications at the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau, and he's also the Center County appointee to America 250 PA. So he's been heavily immersed in this and uh, has enjoyed the experience. And as a, as a history and outdoor buff, uh, he has en enjoyed the experience, and he's the perfect person to lead it. Um, Senator Phillips Hill, I know you um, uh, appreciate the importance of history and tourism, and. Uh, uh, thank you for your service to the Explore York, our colleagues at Explore York, uh, your service to their board, and uh, Representative Solomon, great to see you again. And I still fondly remember my uh, 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 field trip from my previous employer in Philadelphia where you took us on a great tour of uh, Northeast Philly. You're, you're one of the best tour guides I've ever seen. So thank you. <laughs> no, that restaurant was great. Um, so, um, Commissioner H Commissioners Higgins and, and uh, Concepcion and Representative Takak, uh, you know, quite frankly, stole a lot of the thunder from me. I, I think they articulated almost everything that uh, that we were going to say. But you can see the importance of history and tourism here from the turnout that we had from our constituents. And I think you saw some recurring themes uh, from uh, the history of uh, rail line. And so I'm going to continue uh, to emphasize the, the line that Commissioner Higgins uh, talked about, what uh, the line from Tyrone to uh, Lock Haven that runs through Center County and uh, Belfont can be a perfect uh, hub and spoke location for people. Uh, Commissioner C Higgins talked about the investment that's being made there. When I came here four and a half years ago, uh, in potential investors in hotels and bed and breakfasts and restaurants 
and retail uh, were unsure about whether uh, to invest their money. I think uh, today you see the cranes in State College and, and uh, you see construction in other parts of the county, uh, including Belfont and uh, Phillipsburg. And I think it's because uh, we do have so much more than Penn State. And so America 250 PA is a perfect opportunity to shine a spotlight on those assets. And um, uh, you know, I really was struck by the, on your website, the platforms that you talk about emphasizing. And it just occurred to me that we have almost all of these things in a significant degree. You talk about celebrating and revitalizing culinary and agricultural traditions. We're in the heart of a bread basket of Pennsylvania. Um, we have spent a lot of time in our organization promoting the agritourism assets of this county, and that has, what, what has turned out to be a great family attraction, so we want to continue that emphasis. We have a growing art and cultural scene at the PA Military Museum. We have six state parks. And so that train, that excursion train along that line that at different times was known as the Tyrone and Lock Haven Railroad, uh, uh, the Bald Eagle Valley Railroad that goes, that connects those, these sites to um, accelerate uh, or to revitalize that excursion line, I think is critical. And we'd like to advocate for another half a million worth of, of uh, both study and physical assets uh, to improve that. Um, Commissioner Higgins emphasized the Belfont portion, but it's an 84 mile line. Uh, as he said, it would involve three counties. So we're, we're very much wanting to involve our neighbors. And uh, so that's, that's really the critical uh, ask that we make is just to reinforce the importance of that line. Um, there are not many rail lines, excursion la uh, rail lines that people in the two, within a two hour drive can enjoy. There are in other parts of the state. The Colebrook Dale on the southeast part of the line is a good uh, example, but we think we can do something like that here. And uh, I can't think of a better place where you would see the diversity of, uh, of Pennsylvania than along that line. So, um, and I would be remiss, uh, I'm, I'm going to be bad and say that I'm going to put in a plug. I know this is an infrastructure committee, but uh, if we're going to shine a spotlight on these assets, we need to talk about uh, marketing at some point too. So I hope there's, there's somebody thinking about marketing all those assets. I know you are, Cassandra, but uh, let's, uh, hopefully there's going to be a conversation about that soon. Happy to take any questions. And as I, I'm here more to support Fritz and answer some questions. Uh, I have a few details that I could share. Thank you. And if you look at the, the, the map, the big map that you've been handed, and the, on the far left corner is really that, that line. Uh, and it goes right, right past Bald Eagle State Park where uh, uh, our Ironman competition is gonna take place just a, a month from, uh, to, uh, a month and two days from now. Uh, Iron Man will start in Bald Eagle Lake, and uh, uh, so that, that is a, pr a great event that sort of highlights all of the great outdoor assets in, in Pennsylvania, and it's great, uh, uh, great event. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> Representative Takeak. Got to keep up the streak. <laughs> First of all, I just want to acknowledge your role in helping coordinate a lot of the testimony today. I know you have a lot on your plate with the <laughs> Iron Man, as you mentioned, and other things. Uh, uh, there's a lot here to talk about, and, yeah. and I think it's really great. But one of the things that you said, I think, brings up a few other things for me. One is that this is a hub. Right. Uh, you know, obviously, a lot of folks come in for Penn State and, and are drawn to this area for other reasons. but but we have all the outdoor resources. We have the Rothrock State Forest with all of the hiking trails and all of the other things. Not too far from here, we can also connect up with the Snowshoe Rails to Trail Association. So there's a lot of ATVs and outdoor connections. And I'm working with uh, Representative Owlet and others to kind of connect that whole um, uh, infrastructure, if you will, on trails. Uh, working with DCNR and others. So uh, it really is um, a showcase and in, in drawing people in, but then once they're here, we have the infrastructure, the expertise, and 
um, to, to keep people in the area and again, address those, the civic and educational and cultural uh, resources in this area. So I just really wanted to highlight that. I don't know if I missed anything in that litany, but, but there's so much here. It's, I, I hate to sound too much like a cheerleader, but it is my district. And, and <laughs> so it is well, my I uh, think to, prerogative. To, yeah. And I think to, to uh, expand on that point, Representative Takak, is, is the, the fact that we've got a lot of those assets already here. This is, we don't have to do a whole lot of new building uh, of assets. It's a matter of uh, revitalizing some of the historical assets, taking advantage of infrastructure that's here and just improving it, putting some money into it. And then those, those things will live on and be sustainable and, and help with tourism moving forward. Other questions? Senator? I, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and that's certainly, uh, I think, something that the broader commission is looking to tackle, which is we know that Pennsylvania's history is our nation's history. People will be very focused on what happened um, in Philadelphia. But there's a lot of important history, as we've heard detailed today, um, here in, in greater Center County, um, as there is down in York. I'm sure that I know Representative Mursky, state <laughs> senator, and he is incredibly proud of Erie and thinks that the world revolves around Erie. <laughs> um, I, I will say that I've been known to be a little parochial and feel that you know, the world really revolves around York. <laughs> and um, you know, it's, it's so clear that Pennsylvania has so much to offer. And appreciate the work that you are going to do working with people like um, Laura Wagner to, at our Convention and Visitors Bureau, we call Explore York, to get out that message. And so the broader commission is going to be focused on that. We're really focused on creating those spaces, uh, places, and things that are going to get people to go from Philadelphia, no offense to the good gentleman from <laughs> Philadelphia, um, and, and bring them to York and, and to State College in Center County and then up to Erie um, because Pennsylvania has a lot to offer. Yeah, I think it's, it's the idea, you know, in the business that we're in, it's always about planting the, idea, the seed of the idea in a person that they've got to stay longer. You've got to plan for more time to come, and I think that's why this initiative is so valuable uh, because it will knit Pennsylvania together and it will knit our colleagues, you know, all of us who are promoting tourism across the state. It'll give us a chance to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you. you it says here that you have private outside funding, but it's not committed. So what, what does that mean? <laughs> you Do you, take that in? Yeah, go ahead. Ed. We have our, our funding that uh, we have for the uh, Happy Valley Adventure Bureau, and uh, we have funds that we would look to direct towards this initiative to support it, um, along with the, uh, the Belfont Railroad, Historical Railroad Society. Um, we think that there are other projects that uh, would be needed along the way extra rail perhaps to connect all of our tourism destinations and recreation destinations. Um, so we'd be looking to, uh, not meaning to speak for Fritz, but we'd be looking to redirect some funding uh, and direct towards this project to support it. We're trying to identify as many public-private partnerships as we can and get uh, uh, businesses to engage in 2026. So. Any idea, right? The price tag's four million. Is there a sense of how much uh, of that would be private? Yeah, I, w I would say that uh, the guesstimate there would be at least fifty percent of it would. We we think that we'd be, be able to get some some uh, some federal money as well, hopefully. Um, but uh, we have uh, we're blessed here with a good phil philanthropic community. Uh, a lot of Penn State grads have have done well, and I think they're very. They're fiercely proud uh, of the area. Many of them come back after a successful career in Philadelphia or New York and, and come back to this area. And uh, uh, they are very energized by the tourism energy that's, that's occurring here in Center County. And I think that with some state money, 
and some federal money, and if the, the Adventure Bureau would contribute some, I think that would, uh, that would stimulate some, some uh, private contributions and, and turn it into a great public-private partnership. Thank you. Sure. The Happy Valley Adventure Bureau um, represents more than 300 direct tourism-related businesses in the county. So we'd be looking to uh, gather funds and partner with as many of those businesses as possible. There's also the indirect businesses that, uh, as Fritz talked about, uh, that support tourism in some way, that benefit from tourism in Center County. So we'd be looking to engage with uh, many private entities as well. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Representative Mursky. Just one question. Um, so if this project were funded, uh, in terms of maintenance, would this uh, joint rail authority then be responsible for the long-term uh, sustainability of this project? I think that would be something to be discussed. Yeah, I think it's something to, to be determined. I mean, they are the owner uh, uh, of the line, and, and so, you know, most likely they would have to incur that, but uh, uh, be responsible for that, but I think that's a detail to be worked out. Yeah. Okay. Certainly they'd have to feel comfortable uh, with the overall financial structure uh, in order to take that, that, that on. Absolutely, but I, I guess my point is we want to make sure that we're funding stuff that's, that's not one and done, that there's going to be some sustainability to it that when we're investing state money into a project that um, there's a long-term benefit to the region and then henceforth to Pennsylvania. We completely agree with that. Any project would need to be sustainable and be comfortable from all entities' viewpoints. I think this ride, uh, when, when, when it comes to fruition, is really going to be one of the great tourism attractions in Pennsylvania. And I, I have great thoughts about that, and combined with some healthy marketing uh, would really generate some substantial revenue to help with those costs. The whole thing is exciting when, when you, uh, to the Senator's point, when you look at all of the projects and then combine them together and then the connectivity with the rail, oh, sorry, with the rail line, uh, it's really that it's placemaking. And then when you have placemaking, then you have destinations that people want to visit. And to your point, then you have people who used to take a one or two day stay and then they make it a three, four, five day stay because there's stuff to do. And so um, that's what we're looking for. Very exciting. Uh, there are certainly mail, many rail, rail fans around the nation that would come into such an excursion as we're proposing here. And having prior uh, uh, involvement with the Altoona Railroad Museum and with the East Broad Top Railroad, uh, I know that uh, certainly linking up with our surrounding colleagues and working with our neighbors uh, is certainly very important to this project will need to happen. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Representative Takak for his Closing remarks. You hope so. <laughs> no. Uh, Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. I just wanted to highlight one thing that that sort of got skimmed over a little bit, and Fritz mentioned it. You know, being in the the breadbasket of Pennsylvania in many ways too. I did want to point out that um, our congressman, uh, Congressman Glenn Thompson, known universally here as GT, um, is the chair of the Congressional Agriculture Committee writing the Farm Bill right now. He is actually the first chair of that committee from Pennsylvania since the Civil War. So I do think that there's some interest in potential for funding and other opportunities to uh, make this not only um, a regional, a state, but also uh, a national investment uh, in this area as well. And I, I also know that the senators have been very supportive of projects like this in the past, so thank you. Thank you, and we'll turn it over to uh, Cassandra Coleman for some closing remarks. Sure, so thank you. Um, I just wanna thank everybody again for being here and for presenting your projects. Um, as both chairs had mentioned, we will be on tour <laughs> all summer through um, September 1 with these 12 public hearings. So we will be coming back to the region just to a different county. So again, we encourage you to um, watch for different programming and projects and just we appreciate all of the support. So thank you again for being here. Um, Representative Mursky. Thank you. Just briefly, I want to thank all of the testifiers today. And um, 
in a former life before I was a legislator, I was a history teacher. And so you're speaking my language and I just want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. These projects are sound projects, they're quality projects and if they don't get funded here, uh, please keep pushing for them because I think that these are quality projects that are going to enhance this region and uh, I want to thank all of you for that. Thank you. Mr. Smeal. Just wanted to mention, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, uh, Representative Benninghoff, it, it's safe to say, you know, he's, he's supportive of the whole historic uh, preservation of this area and just listening to all of this, I mean, I've always been in central Pennsylvania, I had no idea that, you know, it was as involved as it is and the importance of it. Uh, and being from Bullsburg, uh, I love that little town. And one thing that I wanted to mention was uh, the Columbus Chapel. You know, uh, you know the, the the Bull Mansion and other aspects. The historic town, uh, Belfont. You know, we're very blessed with everything that that we you know have here. And anything, any support that Representative Benninghoff will do, he you know, he will as funding permits. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Solomon. Thank you all for the testimony. It's great to be here. You have a great representative and Representative Paycack. The number of text messages, calls, and emails he was sending me <laughs> asking about the details of this hearing. I love his energy that he's bringing to his district. It's great to see. He wants economic investment right here. And thank you so much for your support. With that, I would like to thank all of the testifiers, uh, all of the members and the volunteers who participated in today's hearing. Our next public hearing is scheduled for Friday, June 9th, and we will be up in Wilkesbury. Is that the way we say it? Indeed, very good. Well, and with that, the committee now stands in recess until the call of the chair. Thank you again.